Michael Fields in East Troy. We're gonna head down into their garden plots where I have the hives located. There we are. First thing we're gonna do is get a little smoke going. It calms the bees. They think there's a fire. When they smell the smoke, and the first thing they do when they smell, think there's a fire, is fill themselves with honey. They gorge themselves. And they fill themselves so full that they can't stick their stinger out. So it not only calms them, it helps the beekeeper. Everybody asks me, do you get bit? <laughs> Bees don't bite, they sting. Because <laughs> once a honeybee stings you, unlike a lot of the other bees, once a honeybee stings you, it loses its life. They only sting to protect the hive. If they feel endangered, that's when they come out and sting. My grandfather on the Zinnaker side was a beekeeper. Back then, everybody was beekeepers. My, uh, my father, my sister, my son, they all kept bees. And it just seemed to be a natural thing, I guess. What we're gonna do today is remove the honey supers. Everything below that is where the bees live and, and raise young. And everything above that board is what we call excess honey. And these are, these are referred to as honey supers. They seal them up pretty good. So this is, this is what we're harvesting right now. These frames are put in empty and the bees finish drawing them out. And if you, if you look here, Every one of these are all cells just like this, but they've got a wax capping on there. And below that wax is the beautiful honey. This honey super, or this box, is beautifully filled. This is where the beekeeper gets a bad back. All the bees are below this board. How many bees do you think are in there? 20,000, 30,000. There's a lot of bees in there. Like right now is the peak of the population of the honeybee. And from this point, August, middle of August, the population will start to decrease. Taking the first frame out is always the most difficult. And we do it very slowly so we don't hurt any bees. The young bees are all hatching out and they're opening this up now to store honey. These caps, and these are the last bees that are gonna hatch, and they've gone through the process. Let's see, we could maybe see this. I don't know how long you wanna watch it, but you can see the head of the bee and its feelers are coming out. They're chewing their way out. Here she comes. Come on now. There, come here, there we go. There. Oh, it's been a long time. Now we're off to the honey house to unload this, put it in the honey house, make sure it's in a dry location. We let it sit in there for a few days, with all the air moving around, and then we extract it. This is the Honey Valley. Honey Creek flows through this whole thing. And that's where, that's where I get the name of my company, Honey Valley Aperies. Apery is the location of beehives. Just this year now, I'm starting to uh, retire. My wife and I own a plumbing and heating business. My son is now 
taking over. So I got the best of all the worlds right now. And I get to enjoy, I got good health and I get to enjoy beekeeping. All these are the same supers. At one point when the super was just about full, I took out a frame and I put in a special frame with an ultra thin foundation. The foundation is the wax in the center and they build comb honey. This one here is, is a perfect, even the flaw makes it perfect. So that is nature's finest right there. That's the perfect food. Well, that's good. So this is the 2015 crop. We've already been out to the bee yards. We pulled all the honey off the hives. We stored it in the building for four days, I guess, with two dehumidifiers running and lots of fans and lots of heat. Take, taking all the excess moisture out of the honey. And now we're taking the honey out of the frames through the extraction process, and that's what we're doing today. Today we have Jenny Zinnaker and Tim Zinnaker and Jake O'Leary, my grandson. We take, the, take this right from the beehive. Then we remove the frames like this. And then we take the frame out. So the machine, the first machine then peels this cap off and exposes the honey. The cappings drop into the tank and the frame slides further down and they take it and put it in a big centrifuge or what we call the extractor. And as it spins, it, all the honey flies out and uh, down into a tank and we put it in proper tanks. I can remember 50 years ago, my grandfather doing the exact same thing with a hot knife. He would take a hot knife and he would take the uh, caps off instead of this machine. And he would put in a little extractor that held maybe six, eight frames. And he'd turn it with a crank and it would be a two or three day process to do the honey from his two or three hives. I'm hoping that today we, heart, we, we extract about 2,000 pounds. What do you find customers and people say about your, your honey? I don't, I'm not a big horn blower, but they all say that they've never had honey that tastes that good. And I think the reason is, is the care that we give the honey all through the season and all through the extraction process, all through the bottling, putting it in glass is huge. Uh, not heating the honey at all and not straining. We don't strain the honey, we don't run it through a filter. Uh, every once in a while, you'll get a little piece of wax floating on the top. That's a plus. That's a bonus. And I think that adds to the flavor. And it, it's just God's pure honey. That's what it is. Fill me up one more of those. So let's, that's probably all we're going to bottle today then. And then the last thing that we put on the jar is to let people know that they're buying local honey. Pretty well everywhere that I have my honey, people are buying it for that purpose right there. They're aware of that local honey is from all the flowers and the pollen and the nectar that you are familiar with and that what you're uh, accustomed to breathing and eating. And somebody gets to enjoy it.
In the understanding of what is green and organic and lush throughout the state, East Troy, Wisconsin might be underestimated. But in fact, it is the home to the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute. When it was founded in 1984, it was the beginning of something that would have repercussions not just throughout the Midwest and Wisconsin, but for the whole globe. It was a multi-acre incubator to play those things forward, the way that the soil is considered a living entity, the way that the air and the critters that interface with it move the planet forward and give us the food that we eat. It was perfectly put in Wisconsin, and it has made all the difference in the years moving forward. Hi, Christine. Hi, Kyle. Great How to are have you. you. Good, yeah. good. The sun has cooperated. Yes, finally. Do you get to come to work here every day? I do, I do. Our founder had a strong belief in biodynamics. He came from England and his wife was, was German. Um, they had a German architect come to the United States to mm -hmm. build this. He wanted it to be a, um, a cathedral to agriculture. Yeah, it has the sense of coming right out of the ground or as if it was here long before many other things. Good, yeah. good. Yes. This is the newest building on site. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here for the dinner. Yes. And to see the green things coming out of the ground and we're gonna tell some stories and I'm gonna understand a little bit more about these fields that are Michael's. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 Okay, let me show you around. Cool. What is Michael Fields? So Michael is the patron saint of this um, time period in biodynamics. Mm -hmm. um, and then the fields are his fields. So this is the patron saint's field. I mean, it's cool because it's institutes like this that are starting to change big scale American farming where they understand that the soil is, and now it's scientifically proven, a living thing. Yes. So you've got this myriad of things growing here organically. This is where we're growing our cherry tomatoes. We are doing some trials this year. We're mainly a market garden, so we want to see what tastes best. We did probably seven to ten plants of about 20 different varieties this year. So you're growing for flavor and, and taste is primary, and then if it's the ugly duckling, that's really not such a big deal. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, deliciousness yep. is really what you're going for. Yep. I am geeking out on the poetry inside this uh, we have a chocolate cherry house. and a black cherry. There's Estherina, Juan Flame. Yes. I you want to try a green tiger? Oh, yeah. yeah. This is not your typical tomato. No. Yeah. And, and that also is because, like I said, we're a, more of a market garden. Our, our, we sell at farmer's markets. So we need to compete with people's backyard gardens mm -hmm. and with everybody else that has every, you know, the same thing. Competing with people's backyard gardens in Wisconsin over tomatoes, <laughs> it's is, hard. Is, that's a tough business right there. <laughs> right. This is crazy. Not bad. It's like a watermelon rind mixed with some, <laughs> some cream and then a little citrusy bite. So the chef has just pulled in, no? Yes. Um, Tyler uh, um, Salisbury from the Black Sheep and White Water is going to be our chef tonight. We've been working with him on the menu and came out and toured the area a little bit last week. We work with a few chefs and so we like to give them a lot of options. Uh, we have regular basil, opal basil, Thai basil, um, an orange thyme, a regular thyme. So for a small little garden, we're, you know, Yeah, yeah I would say you're pretty okay. productive. The crab apples and the flowers that we have planted, um, this big wildlife area behind us, it's all to bring in the native um, pollinators. Right around the corner here, we have the bees. I believe Dan was just out here collecting the honey, yeah. uh, which some of it we're going to be using in our meal tonight. So, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So what's left are just um, the boxes so the bees can fill them up and make it through the winter. So over here we have um, most of our fall brassicas, a lot of... Brassicas? <laughs> that would be your kale. So okay. here you see um, purple kale, um, I believe it's called red boar, winter boar, and mm -hmm. then that's Toscano, the flat leaf back there. And then we have our Brussels sprouts. All of Michael Fields is organic. 
Yep. And I know that because I see weeds that are growing just as vibrantly and healthy <laughs> as the brassicas and the other things. Uh, mostly my students go to the farmers markets to get them used to selling and marketing and you know talking mm -hmm. about their um, their product. But I was there helping out one day and I heard one of them say, you know, you should be worried about the leaves that don't have any bug marks on it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good point. It's a good point. Okay, so now we're to the pepper field. We have anchos, which are, you know, kind of medium temperature range. <laughs> I don't know if I like where you're going here, lady. <laughs> and then we have bananas way at the end, but in between there are jalapenos and our cayennes, and they're hot. <sighs> I'm trying to be a good guest. Okay, let's go banana, let's go banana. <laughs> <laughs> How bad is this gonna hurt? That's a banana pepper. Was there a good way to, I mean, look at this gnarly oh. thing. It's kind of making a fist at me. That, that Solidarity. Solidarity, yeah, that's the, <laughs> la cloenza, yeah. la cloenza. <laughs> All right, here goes some heat. Well, that's not so bad. No, that's not so bad. You were kind to me. Do you want to try just a jalapeno? Let's step this up. Whatever's next. The jalapenos are hotter than you think. I think they're all hot. <laughs> I mean, I, when I was a kid, pepperoni pizza, too spicy for me because of the pepper. I'm not kidding. So is this part of the Michael Fields guest hazing program? <laughs> no, just for you. <laughs> it's uh, okay. Yeah, love it. All right, so. Yeah. Um, it's gonna be a little spicy, but we can, Eat some ground cherries afterwards to get it out. All right, hold my hand. <laughs> okay, good luck. Oh my gosh, oh no. <laughs> this is not my happy place right now, Christine. You can spit it out, it's okay. <laughs> I warned you. Oh my but God. But hey, thanks that's for being really a good That's really hot. Sport. They're, they're I mean, really hot. Yeah, they are. That's legitimately <laughs> hot. Ground cherries? The, yeah, let's, yeah, where are they? Yeah, where are they like right now? Just, I'll run. So these are ground cherries and you just kind of shake them? No, these are salvation. <laughs> oh, they're like little tomatillos. Yeah, Oh, but they're mm -hmm. sweet. And this will help? Yeah, well, you know, it's not another no, pepper. No, you promise. <laughs> Is it helping? Oh, we're gonna get some emails over this. All right, what more do we have to do out here? <laughs> Curse you, peppers. Christine, thank you for the um, mostly painful, I mean, excuse me. Freudian slip. It's okay. <laughs> Christine, thank you for the mostly painless tour. Uh, I'm just, you mind if I just walk around? No, please. Soak I actually it up. need to go get ready for tonight and get my game face on. So, yeah, yeah thank you so much for coming out. I'm going to lose myself in, in the fields and then I'll good. see you. At okay, yeah. sounds good. Just over my shoulder is the first of what I hope will be many farm dinners here at the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute. It is a testament to everything that comes out of the ground and all of the dishes tonight, with the exception of the rabbit, did come forth from this fertile soil. I know it will be delicious. excited that it sold out. I can't even believe it. Um, so thank you so much everybody for coming. This has been a dream of mine for a long time. Bright, tart, nutty, and just the softest hint of that honey. To sit here in the grounds where the bees did their busy work and pulled all those flavors into the hive from which they could be extracted. This is a blessing.
Jeff, I am stoked for this. All right, good. Well, I am happy to give this to you. This is our uh, creamy polenta here with, of course, some good Wisconsin cheese, a little bit from uh, Belgioso in there. We've got some Wisconsin uh, goat cheese. Wisconsin's a great dairy state for goats as well. We've got our rabbit. It's a sustainable rabbit from regenerative roots. Of course, there's a tomato slice, an heirloom tomato slice, and then our tomato jam right on top of there. So enjoy. That's sublime summer eating right there. Oh man. It's so rich and warm but lofty. And then you get this fresh shock of tomato that's buried inside there, straight out of the garden. It's so good. That's really nice. This is how a summer evening should end. This is a testament to who we are, how we're changing the planet, how Wisconsin's on the edge in the best way for the best things that we can pay forward.